with it. Thank you. Thank you. Ready? Ready? Hello. Good evening. Thanks very much, Steve, for organising this evening. And thank you all for coming out. Uh, nice big turnout again. Um, we're having, uh, we're having a, can I just ask first before we start, how many members and how many non-members? Yeah, members? Uh, okay, all right. Well, thank you all for joining and I hope I'll persuade some of the rest of you to join by the end of this evening. Um, and let me just start by going through the last week. We've had a really, really fantastic week, a really fantastic week. Uh, and all of that started last Thursday with the local elections. Um, but before I get into that, I'm going to go back a little bit further than that to the, the 29th of September uh, last year in Torquay, so not a million miles from here. There was a certain leadership election result announced in a hotel in Torquay. Uh, and this left me with a very difficult choice. This left me wondering, what am I going to do now? What do I do next? And my options were to stay in UKIP and sort of fight it out, uh, as some people suggested I do, leave and join another party, or the silent option three, which I rarely mention, was walk away altogether. Uh, I decided option three wasn't an option after all, uh, because the job still hasn't been done. Uh, and sometimes you want a job done, you do it yourself. Um, and that's what led me to option two, which was to leave and start my own party. Uh, in that time, it took us about four months just to get registered with the Electoral Commission. We uh, had various different arguments with them about our name and various different things. They were, weren't happy with our constitution for a while. Then they didn't like our emblem, which is the Trident of Britannia. Uh, so we were back and forward arguing with them. We finally got everything in place about three weeks before last week's local elections. We had, by that time, missed the deadline to uh, put our emblem on the ballot paper, and we had missed the deadline to get our leaflets out by the postal vote. And despite all of that, we managed last week, in a dozen or so seats that we stood, and I had intended it just as a, let's dip our toe into the water, see how we get on. Uh, plus, the candidates were really excited and enthusiastic, and while I was nervous about it, I didn't have the heart to say no. So I thought, with trepidation, let's see how we get on. Uh, and I'll just give you an idea of how we got on. With a few weeks of leafleting, we, in one seat in uh, the West Midlands, in Sandwell, we came in with more votes than UKIP. Uh, in another two seats, we came in with more votes than the Greens. In another two seats, we came in with more votes than the Liberal Democrats. And in one seat, we got within 16 votes of Labour and in another within nine votes of the Conservatives. Uh, that, to me, was an astonishing result, and I was absolutely over the moon. We had, in three weeks, we'd scarcely been a party, managed to get that close to the Conservatives and Labour and defeat, or at least, yes, defeat, uh, all of the other small parties in the race. So that has given us an enormous boost, an enormous boost. It's been a very, very busy week. Um, I've been, I was in Kent on Tuesday night. It was a standing room only event. Uh, people who weren't members were members by the time they left. We had two branches, I think, being formed, or two, uh, two people wanting to form branches. I think there's just one major Kent one being formed now. Uh, and, and it's been overwhelming. I'm absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, but in, in, in many ways, really, really surprised. In many ways, not surprised at all. Because I've been convinced for years that the kind of things I'm saying, the majority of the country agrees with me. Uh, they're just afraid to say so. Most people agree with me, but are afraid to say so. And I think various, I mean, this is a very particularly beautiful part of the country. Uh, but I think regardless of what part of the country you live in, at some point, there's going to be no escaping what the national government is doing to this country. No escaping it. Uh, we, it, it, it there, there, there's no, there's going to be no escaping the mass immigration, and the mass immigration is not going to stop. It's not going to stop. You might, uh, we've had a new Home Secretary in the last week or so, a Conservative Home Secretary, or a Conservative Home Secretary, uh, who within hours 
in the office decided that he was going to take a more liberal approach to not just immigration, but illegal immigration. In a few hours, the Conservative Home Secretary decided that it should be a pleasant, Britain should be a pleasant environment for illegal immigrants within only a few hours. This comes on the top of Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary, saying a week or so earlier uh, that we ought to give an amnesty to illegal immigrants. So you have two of the most senior people in government, the Foreign Secretary and the Home Secretary, within a week or so of each other, sending out an invitation to the world that Britain is yours, all you have to do is get here. We will make no trouble for you. Doesn't matter whether you're legal or illegal, whether you break the law, how are we going to, they're already breaking the law, how are we going to deal with them when we don't know who they are, where they come from? We've already got a million people in this country that we can't account for, a million at least that we can't account for. And none of that is going to stop under either Labour or the Conservatives or any of the small parties. None of that is going to stop. So no matter where you live in this country, this is going to catch you. And if it doesn't catch you, it will catch your children and your grandchildren. So there's four main reasons why I'm not surprised that this party is succeeding. Uh, and someone this week on, on social media described the popularity that we've had, the, the success that we've had. We've got about 4,000 people signed up now. Uh, and the success that we've had uh, is unprecedented, as one person called it. Um, and again, that doesn't surprise me at all, because of four things. There are four things that this party is doing right. And it's the four reasons that we are going to succeed and we're going to get bigger and bigger. And one of those is clarity. We have a very, very clear message from this party. Uh, there's no infighting, there's, uh, there's a unity, and what's just great about starting off a party in the way that we did is that everyone came for a reason, everyone came for the same reasons. We don't have infighting, we don't have disputes, everyone is united behind the same cause. And it's not an anti-Islam cause, no matter what the media calls it, it's not an anti-Islam cause, it's a For Britain cause. That's why we called it For Britain. Uh, and it couldn't be a better name. I absolutely love the name. But clarity is our, one of our great selling points, and it will continue to be. Uh, on certain issues, clarity on the European Union. It's, we're, we're very clear. And we've had media attention because of this clarity. We're not just a pro-Brexit party, but an anti-EU party. And we don't just see a post-Brexit future for this country. We see a post-EU future for this country. And that post-EU future is coming very quickly. It's coming faster than we think. I think the EU is on its last legs. I don't believe Brexit is enough. I don't believe Brexit's going to save us. I don't believe, in fact, Brexit's going to happen at this stage. I didn't start out feeling like that, but the further it goes on, the more I don't believe it's going to happen at all. If it does happen, it will be in name only. We'll end up in a sort of a, a Norway situation. Uh, where we'll still have open borders. I mean, great, Norway doesn't have to pay the extortionate fees to be a member of this thing, but they still have open borders. Uh, they still are subject to regulations laid down by the EU. And I don't believe that anyone in Europe, whether a member of the EU or not, can get away from the European Union. I don't believe they can. The only, the only way out of the European Union is if we get rid of the European Union. That is a clear message that we want to achieve because it's the only way we're going to get out. It really is the only way we're going to get out. Uh, and there's a growing movement for this. There's a growing movement for this, and we're not alone. We're the only party saying it in this country, but we're not the only people saying it across Europe. I was in Belgium on Saturday, uh, and the room, a room full of people saying exactly the same thing. People from the Netherlands, people from Germany, people from Belgium, people from Sweden, uh, all saying the same thing. We've got to stop the EU. We've got to get rid of the EU. Because the EU is the reason, well, pr primarily the reason, certainly in the last few years, for the massive, massive migration that we've seen coming to Europe uh, from the Middle East and Africa, from cultures and societies which have nothing in common with ours, which will not integrate into ours. And the reason I know they won't integrate into ours is because they haven't before. In 30, 40, 50 years, we've had immigration coming from these countries 
and we have all these problems. We have second generation who we can't integrate. So what makes us think that if we open up to millions more, it will go be better this time? No, it won't. It'll be exactly the same because we're still encouraging people, one sec, we're still encouraging people uh, to bring their own culture with them, to hate and ignore British culture uh, and to segregate and to segregate. And this is still going on and it is now largely because of the European Union. And I want us to A, give that clear message that we want rid of the EU, uh, but B, to give a clear message on why we want rid of the EU. Uh, I, the, the, the discussion around the European Union is always about economics, always about economics. It's always about big business. It's always about big trade deals. And that's all you ever hear. Uh, and people switch off. People get tired of hearing this. They do. I know because I'm one of them. Uh, you know, the people are not interested in their day. People can't relate international trade with their daily lives. I mean, perhaps you should, because of course it matters. It's our economy. It's what put food, puts food on the table. Uh, but let's get back to, to talking about issues. Let's get back to talking about the kind of society that the children and grandchildren of this country will be living in. Let's get back to talking about immigration. We will, only, only public opinion can save Brexit now, uh, if at all. Uh, and public opinion is not going to be strong enough if we, if we don't, if we only talk about trade. It's not going to be strong enough. Nothing, trade is not going to stir the passions of people. But your grandchildren will be living in a totalitarian society where British uh, identity, culture, heritage will be completely dismantled and destroyed. That will stir people's attentions. That will get people concerned. And that will get people rising up against the European Union. We need clarity on it. We also need clarity on law and order. Law and order is a mess. We don't have any. We don't have any. Uh, it's, it's an absolute insanity. We are importing violent gangs from violent parts of the world who are bringing their tribal, uh, tribal violence from their own countries and their own societies into Britain and fighting tough wars on British streets from places like Congo. Uh, I, I, there was another country, you know, these are countries where we have machete fighting on the streets of Britain now. We didn't suddenly start, the British didn't suddenly start, let's start killing each other with machetes. This is imported, this is imported, and we can't cope with it. We can't cope with it. I don't know, you, you must have seen some of what's happening in London. I, the, you know, the, we can't cope with this. We have a murder rate that's going through the roof. We can't cope with this. I mean, we would cope better if we had a couple of competent politicians, which we don't, certainly not leading London. Uh, but we can't cope with it. And we can't cope either with the, uh, the cultural crime that we're importing. The disgusting things like child marriage, which is going on with impunity in this country. Uh, uh, female genital mutilation going on with impunity in this country. We need some clarity on our laws. We need everyone who comes to this country to be told in no uncertain terms that this is Britain, not Somalia, not Pakistan. And if you break any of our laws, you will be sent straight back home and you will not be allowed to enter this country again. That needs to be told to everyone as soon as they get off the plane in this country. Better yet, let's stop the planes altogether. But aside from that, before we get to stopping the planes altogether, which is obviously key, the people who are already here need a strong message. They need a strong message. We won't tolerate this. You will not bring your 7th century barbarism to our 21st century country. We will not have it. We will throw you out. They need to hear this, they need to be told this. And if Antifa and the Labour Party and the Momentum and the loopy left complain, we tell them, tough, this is how it is. Because the Conservatives are so afraid of the loopy left that they've become them. They've become them. They're now spouting left-wing nonsense because, they're too, they, they, because the left will really go after you. They'll really go after you, they're vicious. Uh, but have a, bit of, have a backbone. If you haven't got a backbone to be standing up to the left, then you shouldn't be in this job. You shouldn't be in this job. So the government accountability is another clear message. And public sector accountability is another clear message. I want local people to be able to sack their chief constable. 
I want local people to be able to sack the chief executive of their local hospital. I want local people to be able to sack the chief executive of their local government. Uh, and it, I'm not necessarily talking about elections. Someone suggested to me elections that all these people should be elected, uh, which is an interesting idea, and it's a pretty similar to what they do in the US. Uh, but it, A, it would have, we would have elections coming out of our ears. Uh, turnout would be very low, uh, and people would be disinterested. And I think we saw that with the police and crime commissioners as well. Uh, plus, it introduces politics to everything. And when politics is introduced, things get a little bit sour sometimes. But what I would like to see... Uh, and the members will be asked to vote on this policy specifically very soon. I've been saying that for a while, but it is. Now that the elections are over, that's my next thing on my list. But what I would like to see is, is local groups, local groups given the lo local, maybe selected from charities or local organisations, uh, given the authority, the legal authority, to kick out police who are not doing their job. If you look up, uh, up, in, up north to Rotherham, uh, no one, no heads have rolled for that. They let, they let gangs rape underage girls for decades and no one's head has rolled for that. They should have been out on their ear, no pension and lucky, lucky to avoid jail in my mind. Uh, but the local people can do nothing. They could do nothing. I want it so that local people can sack the whole lot of them when they are not doing their jobs. This is the only thing that will change it. This is the only thing that will change it. That they're accountable to the public. That they're accountable to the public. At the, as it is now, they're all accountable to each other. It's a matter of moving someone sideways. Putting them, we can get rid of them from that job and then move them over to that job. They keep a six-figure salary and a nice big fat pension when they deserve nothing at all. Only when the public can really hold these people to account will we have any change. Will they know that they actually have to do their job? This is clear. This is a clear message. It's a clear message. It's a tough message. And it's this kind of clarity that will help us to succeed. The second one, and they're all beginning with C, I came up with four C's. The second one is commitment. There are no careerists in this party. Um, and to join a party like this, you've got to be really committed to the cause. You've got to be really committed to the cause. Uh, there isn't any, uh, we're not, you know, the, the, these old parties like Labour and the Conservatives. Is it, there's, a, there's, a back, there's a brown envelope culture. There's a, bra there's a backhander culture. They've been in situ for so long that they think they are absolutely untouchable. There's no commitment to any cause there. It's a job. It's a career. And they'll do and say anything to get a seat. And when you do and say anything to get your seat, you end up saying everything to everybody, meaning nothing and achieving absolutely nothing. And this is the politics we have across the board, Labour, Tory, the whole lot. They will say anything to keep their seats. This is not commitment. This is not commitment to any cause. It's not commitment to any principle or values. And it's certainly not commitment to this country. Uh, we won't be scared away. We won't be scared away. Uh, if I was going to be scared away, it would have happened by now. Uh, and I, I can't be bought either. Uh, if, you know, again, I can't tell you how many times I've been told, if you don't shut up. Uh, you will never have any kind of political career. If you don't tone it down, if you don't rein it in, if you don't stay quiet, you know, you can say it, but it's the way you say it. And you ne No, no. And it, we're not going to be scared away. If I was going to be scared away, I, I would have done it by now. And it's not just me. People who join this are brave and willing and principled and committed to standing up for this country. And we're not here temporarily either. Uh, and uh, the, the press and the Antifa types can say what they like. They can say what they like. They're calling us another flash in the pan. Uh, it's just another BMP, just another UKIP, just another... Uh, we're, we're various little parties that have, have essentially come and gone. Nonsense. Nonsense. We are not the new UKIP. We are not the new BMP. We are nothing of the kind. We are for Britain. We're completely new ideas, completely fresh. Uh, we do not have uh, any uh, 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 racial issues going on. The party is made up of people of various different backgrounds and various different experiences. Uh, and it will continue. It will continue. People are joining all the time. And what's most encouraging for me is, is the brand, the identity that we're starting to form, that we're starting to evolve. And it's exactly the identity I wanted us to evolve, which was a neither left nor right. Uh, just a basic, down the middle, 
honest to God, uh, straight down the line, no nonsense party which is clearly fighting in the interests of the people of this country. That is exactly what we are becoming, that is the brand we are becoming. Uh, and I know that because we're getting people from all walks of life. We're getting people from uh, terror voters, Labour voters, we've even got a Green voter join recently. Uh, but the, probably the biggest, other than ex-UKIP, they, they are our biggest uh, membership group. But besides that one, the biggest group that I can see coming into the party, and this is really interesting to me and really exciting to me, is the non-voter. The people who've never been a member of anything, any party before, the people who've never aligned themselves with any politics before, and even people who've never voted before. Uh, this is the most common message I get from people, people who write to me when they've joined to tell me why they've joined. This is the most common message I get, was I've never been, never wanted to be involved in politics before. I've never trusted any of you. All politicians are the same. But with you, with your party, uh, I feel inspired to get involved. So we're going nowhere. We're going nowhere. This is, I'm absolutely committed to this, uh, and we're going nowhere. Uh, the third C is common sense. And this again is a, an image that I want us to have, the common sense party. And it is happening, it is evolving. Uh, and we need to use common sense on various different things and nowhere more than when we talk about immigration. Where is the common sense? Where is the common sense? We're up against complete delusion. We're up against delusion. These people are deluded. Uh, you know, you can't say and you can't speak up. If you speak up, they'll, they'll, they'll round in on you, a group of them. And I remember when I was a parliamentary candidate in 2015, uh, I remember the hostings so well. I was the only, you know, we, whenever we would talk about, for example, the demand for housing, oh no, not the demand for housing, we would talk about housing. And every single other candidate up at that table would talk about have, needing to build. Needing to build, we need to build, we need to build. Well, yes, we do need to build. Uh, but what about the demand for housing? And I was always the only one to say it. How can we possibly plan housing when we don't know what the demand is going to be? This is simple economics, supply, demand. It's, uh, greater the demand, the greater the supply needs to be. And if the demand is higher than the supply, you have a crisis, you have a shortage, you have a problem, you have homelessness, you have real uh, housing crisis. During that time, I was the only one at all meetings, and I include, of course, the Conservative Party candidate in that, at all meetings who mentioned demand for housing. And they rounded in on me. You can hear the boos from the audience. You can, this was in London. Uh, you can hear the boos from the audience and the other candidates, including the Tory, sort of lapping up this booze and, yeah, isn't she terrible? This is terrible. This is awful. How dare she mention demand? This is crazy. This is crazy. How can you possibly have a housing policy of any kind when you don't know how many people you have to house and you don't know how many people you're going to have to house this time next year? How can you possibly plan this? We have to get real. We have to get real. This is common sense. If you have 100,000 plus people coming into the country every year that we know of, how are you going to house them? How are you going to house them? You cannot possibly stabilize the country until you start to control the borders and start to understand how many people are going to be coming in every year. This is common sense. It applies also to the health service. Again, we're dealing with people who are deluded. Deluded is the only word. They seem to think that the NHS can cope with providing health care for the whole world. It can't. It can't. There are far fewer beds, by the way, in the NHS now than there were in the 1950s, I think by about half. Now, they don't need the same number of beds as they needed then in terms of medical treatment, but they certainly need it in terms of numbers. How are we going to do it? How are we going to do it? You'll hear the lefties complaining uh, constantly about overcrowded hospitals and overcrowded this and overcrowded GPs, offices, and other, and then they still want mass immigration. And this is all of them. This is all of them. And this is simple mathematics. And you simply won't hear it from any politician. You simply won't hear it. We need to get, grab, because there is a distinct lack of common sense here. We need to grab it and make it ours and watch the success that we'll have because people are desperate for it. People, when they watch Question Time on a Thursday night and see a row 
of uh, repeating the same platitudes. Can you just imagine? Just imagine someone sitting up there saying, come on, you people are deluded. When are you going to get with the, when are you going to get real and understand the numbers? People would love it. People would love it. You would immediately have people excited. You would immediately have people looking up at the television saying, huh, who's that? This is, they just want a bit of honesty and a bit of common sense. Uh, this is, we will grab this with both hands because it's ours to grab. Another place we need common sense is, I've mentioned it briefly, justice, the justice system. Uh, where is the common sense? You can, we can throw out people who uh, came here legally uh, and done, did nothing wrong, while hundreds of jihadis trained by ISIS pour into the country and no one blinks an eye. Where's the common sense? Where is the common sense? And if police are under-resourced, which, which they are, they are, and we do, we can blame the Tories for that. They shouldn't. The police should be fully manned. They should be at full numbers. But when you have an under-resourced police force, what do you do with it? Do you prioritise mean tweets on Twitter? Or do you prioritise violent crime, uh, the gang rape of children? What do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? We should prioritise the violent crime and the gang rape of children, right? What are the police doing? Prioritising mean tweets on Twitter. It is no exaggeration to say that you are more likely, and this is not, a st I don't know this as a st statistical fact, but from observation, my estimation is that in this country today, you are more likely to have the police knock on your door for something that offensive that you've said than you are if you are indulging and engaging in premeditated gang rape of children on a regular basis. You are more likely to have the police come over an offensive tweet. That is shocking and scandalous, and we should not be putting up with it. We should not be putting up with it. Where is the common sense here? Where is the common sense? London, as I mentioned as well, London is a fire, I don't, it's, it's bad to come to, to uh, Newton Abbott and talk about London, but I, um, it, it is still the capital and it is in the news for this reason, so it's worth mentioning. Uh, London's gone crazy. We have children stabbing and shooting children on a, on a weekly basis, if not more, for the last couple of months. Uh, Sadiq Khan, the chocolate teapot, um, Mayor of London, um, he says he doesn't understand. He doesn't understand why crime is so high in London. Okay, let me give you a clue, Sadiq. Uh, number one, because you insist on having the borders open to half the world, who are bringing violent crime with them from, from violent societies, and he's still insisting on that. Uh, and number two, with an under-resourced police force, you have decided that 900 hate crime officers are your priority. So while the Mayor of London, and this is repeated all over the country, it's repeated in Manchester, it's repeated in the West Midlands Police Force, it's repeated all over the country. Uh, rising crime, police have resources into hate crime. Uh, the 900 plus in London alone hate crime officers dedicated to tracking down what we say which might be mean to somebody, we might offend somebody. That is the state that this country is in. Yeah. And until we grab, grab a hold of just an ounce, a morsel of common sense, common sense that tells us that a raped child is more important than someone who's been offended on Twitter. We're only when we grab that back, only when we come back into reality and sanity and remove ourselves from this Orwellian 1984-esque craziness that we're living in, uh, can, we de can we even begin to think of preserving the Britain that we know for future generations? This is urgent. This common sense in our justice system is urgent. Uh, and we must, we must prioritise our money rather better than we are. There is money in this country. It's just how it's being spent. Uh, it's, being, it's being wasted. The public sector is full of waste as well. Uh, public sector uh, chiefs, chief I was reading on the train on the way down, uh, a chief executive, uh, a local government chief executive advertising for a new chief executive, £180,000 was the salary offered. This is a place, by the way, where the council tax went up 5% a few weeks ago. So the people are having to fork out an extra 5% for their council tax, and then they go and advertise for a £180,000 a year chief executive. 
What an insult. What an insult. The money is being frittered away on nothing. And it's being frittered away because they don't fear the electorate. These people don't fear the electorate. Uh, and sadly, I'm sad to say, the reason they don't fear us is pretty much our own fault. Um, not everyone in this room, obviously, uh, but as a wider country, we keep voting for them. We keep voting for them, and they know it. They know it. You saw it in the local elections last week as well. It was Labour Tory, Labour Tory, Labour Tory, Labour Tory. There were no other party stood a chance, and by huge margins as well. It's including up in the north of England, Labour were winning by thousands of votes in council seats. And I, I stand bewildered and think, what will it take? What will it take? It frightens me what it will take. But actually, actually, I think the problem is that there's no real alternative. There has been no real alternative. The rest of them are just the same. The smaller parties that come through are pretty much just the same. I mean, yes, UKIP was great on the EU, uh, but unclear on many other messages. And I think that was the problem. And people tell me often that, you know, we're under the first past the post system, you haven't got a chance. Nonsense. Nonsense. Uh, Labour itself came through under first past the post. Uh, and it didn't take them a great deal of time after forming either, before they were in government. Uh, another example more recently uh, was the Scottish National Party up in Scotland. Um, completely obliterated Labour in the 2015 elections. Completely obliterated them. I expected them to win a few seats. They completely annihilated Labour that night. Uh, took, um, I think, all but two seats from Labour in Scotland, and that was under the first-past-the-post system. Things do happen, things do change, and I think we are due, very much due, at massive change in the political, uh, political climate in this country. For a hundred years now, it's been Labour and Tory, uh, and before that it was Labour, or it was uh, the Tories and the Liberals. It's time now to change it again, and I want us, I would say I want us to go after Labour, I do, uh, Labour primarily, uh, because when, you know, when Labour came through, when Labour, uh, I, think, I think it took them about two decades after forming to, to form a government. Uh, it won't take us that long. Um, the, the, um, there's ambition for you. Um, Labour came through because the ordinary working people had nobody at the time. And we are now in the same situation where working people have nobody. It's a cliché. Uh, but I'll say it anyway, because it's true. Sometimes cliches are true. Uh, Labour has completely transformed into a party for trendy causes, uh, for metropolitan elite, uh, for immigrants, and has completely turned its back on the white working class in this country. Completely turned its back. And it's getting away with that because the white working class are still voting for them. Uh, that's going to change. And the reason it's going to change is because we're going to be the new party for the white working class. Not only the white working class, but very much for the white working class. And we will talk about difficult issues. And this brings me to my fourth C. What time am I on? I won't talk for too much longer because I'd like to take a lot of questions. This takes me to my fourth C, which is courage. Uh, we have had from day one and we'll continue to have the courage to talk about the things that other people won't talk about. And that, and we will talk about it in the way that the ordinary people talk about it. We're not going to dress it up in fancy language, sort of exclusive language, and look how smart we are, look how, look how we speak, we're so much smarter than you. No, we will use plain language and we will tell the truth. And we will do it about the most difficult of issues. And one of those I've just briefly mentioned um, is a white issue. Um, this one will certainly, certainly nobody will talk about, but we will. Uh, and I've been talking about it publicly for some time now. Is the degradation of white people, both in this country and across Europe and across the Western world generally. Um, this is not a vast uh, white genocide conspiracy. It's a reality. It's a reality. This is coming from the United Nations down to the European Union, down to national governments, down to local governments, right across the public sector. Uh, you will see it uh, manifest itself in children being told in a, a uh, uh, what are they called, kindergarten, up in rural Lincolnshire a couple of years ago. 
that the school was too white uh, and they needed uh, to put a bit more colour into it. So they started putting pictures on the walls of everybody but white people. Uh, now, I, this is, I think it's, a, I think it's a, a terrible thing to do, to tell a group, a little room of white children uh, that this room is too white, that they are too white. What kind of self-image is it giving to white children to be growing up in a society where they regularly hear there's too many white people on this board, there's too many white applicants for this job, there's too many white teachers on this, there's too many white police, there's too many white local government, there's too many white, too many white, too many white. Children, white children are growing up hearing this. Now I would object to this if it was black children hearing there's too many black people, but that would never happen. But we are hearing too many white people. We have, a, we have legal, legal discrimination against the white majority in this country. Uh, job applications not open to white people, particularly to white males. Uh, anywhere, anyone else, and we will be looking at a hate crime. Now don't think for a minute that the country doesn't realise this. This is a silent, bubbling away issue. It is bubbling beneath the surface, and if we don't deal with it democratically, if we don't deal with it democratically, you will, you are, it's a ticking time bomb that will be sorted out in a rather less pleasant way than democratically, because this won't last. This can only go on for so long. And the racial tensions in this country are bubbling below the surface, and they are also a ticking time bomb. And these racial tensions are being created by the, by the people who say that they're wiping out racism. They'll, they have an Orwellian campaign to wipe out racism, and in doing so, they are creating more and more racial tension by treating everyone differently. Uh, you see, the, uh, the, the, the Stephen Lawrence murder was in the, the news recently. Uh, now, I have no problem with a memorial for Stephen Lawrence, but I would like to see one for Lee Rigby as well, I think yeah, yeah. that would be, uh, and given, given the fact, actually, Given the fact, actually, that he was a serving British soldier slaughtered on the streets of Britain in broad daylight, I think he's perhaps the most deserving of a memorial uh, of anyone who has been murdered in this country in a long time. Uh, but not only is he not getting a memorial, they're actually against a memorial. People have been trying to get one, uh, but it's too difficult, it's too controversial, it'll, it'll cause community tensions. Let me yeah, let me tell you what causes community tensions. When you give a memorial to one guy because he's black, but you won't give one to a serving British soldier because he's white. That's what's causing tensions. That's what's causing tensions. It's when you let a group of Muslims gang rape white girls all over the country and do nothing. That's what's causing tensions. If you dared to actually treat people the same way, regardless of their skin color, then you will reduce racial tensions. But it's not. We're going in exactly the opposite direction. And the Stephen Lawrence murder, uh, the aftermath of the Stephen Lawrence murder, was actually what created all of this. Or at least it, it solidified it and made it and it embedded it into the law. The Macpherson inquiry, and this is something that I want us as a party to talk about, and no one will do it. No one else will do it. They'd be terrified. Can you imagine saying something against the uh, Stephen Lawrence recommendations? Who in politics is going to say something against the, the recommendations that followed the Stephen Lawrence murder? I tell you, we will. We will. We will go completely against the grain because the country agrees with us. After that murder, the Macpherson inquiry brought the racialization of the police into life. They said that in order to end racism, this is what I said about the 1984 campaign, in order to end racism, we must outlaw colorblind policing. That was their exact words. Colorblind policing must be outlawed in the name of ending racism. Does anyone else see the problem here? They introduced racism. They introduced racism. They introduced the, uh, the, re the requirements for more and more ethnic minority officers. Uh, they felt it essential that in order for, for black people to have justice, it, there must be black police. They racialized the whole country. It, was, it, it, it completely destroyed the, the one law for all democratic system that we ought to have. And I want us to say so. It's a, that is a really difficult issue, but there's another, another element to this. I want us to be the ones who deal with this, these racial problems, and including the anti-white hatred, because that's what it is. 
I want us to deal with it or someone really nasty. Comes. So this is another reason why we have to step up and deal with these issues before they, before they explode out of control or we end up with real neo-Nazis uh, rising into power. Uh, I don't want either of those things and I don't think the majority of people want it either. And the, the last issue, and I'll end on this because we've got about an hour left. Um, sorry, you weren't the organiser, were you? Sorry. Um, the last issue that we'll talk about... Okay, okay. The last issue that we'll talk about that no one else will, even if they pretend that they will, they won't, is, of course, Islam. You knew I was going to get to it in the end. Um, I had, when I was in UKIP, and, and let me just bring this, and I don't like to talk about UKIP too much, but it is important in this context. Uh, what I was told in the times that I was deselected, for example, in 2017 when I was deselected from uh, Lewisham, <coughs> what I was told was, what you're saying is right, but it's the way you say it that's the problem. Um, and essentially what I was told was you can't say things that upset the moderate Muslims. Uh, we can talk about jihadism, we can talk about ISIS, we can talk about Sharia, uh, we can even talk about banning the burqa. But we can't say anything that will upset moderate Muslims because we may lose their support in the Brexit vote. Um, absolute insanity. Absolute insanity. And by the way, that is still UKIP's line. I can promise you that. So here's the way I say it that they don't like. They don't want me to criticize the Quran because I will alienate moderate Muslims. So we're supposed to engage in the politics of let's pretend that's not happening. That's, the poli that's what I call it. That's what the politics is. If we talk about FGM, for example, female genital mutilation, a huge, huge issue um, that uh, UKIP boards had with me was that I insisted on saying that FGM was an, an, an Islamic practice. Uh, this really upsets people. You, nothing will make people go crazy, in, in a, especially in a room full of left-wingers, than telling them that FGM is an, Islam is, an, is an Islamic practice. Not easy to say, actually. Um, nothing will upset them as much, but it is, but it is. It is practiced almost exclusively by Muslims. It was sanctioned several times by Muhammad in the Hadiths. It is justified and sustained the world over by Islamic clerics quoting those Hadiths. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood considers it a major duty. Uh, most Imams and clerics across the world consider it an Islamic practice. But if I say so, I'm causing problems uh, and I need to stop offending moderate Muslims. And when I say, tell the truth about Islam, it's things like this that I mean. This is what I mean. Tell the truth. It's in the scriptures, whether they like it or not, and they don't, but we will tell it anyway. And I'm totally unconcerned about alienating or upsetting moderate Muslims because there are millions and millions of people in this country who know perfectly well what the truth is about this religion, about what it, the kind of societies it creates, about the terrible things written in its scriptures. And if we continue to lie, and if we continue to play the politics of let's pretend that's not happening, let's pretend that's not written there. You know, you can open the Quran and you can show them and you say, look, there it is. Kill the infidel wherever you find them. Subdue the world until all religion is for Allah. Uh, if you, you, you know, at the, the wife-beating verse, which I'm always told isn't in there, point to that. You can point to the hadith where Muhammad married a six-year-old, uh, and this sustains child marriage all over the world to this day and causes child marriage in this country today. You can point to all of that. You can point to the stonings and the lashings and the amputations and the beheadings, and they're all in there. And you can take out a copy of the Hadith and you can point to it and say, there it is, look, look, there it is. And not only is it written in there, it's actually practiced in most Muslim countries, or certainly the ones that call themselves Islamic states. Uh, and you are told, let's pretend that's not there. Let's pretend it doesn't say that. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. 
We have a we have terror attacks. Last year, how many did we have? Four. And after each and every one of them, the government tells us what a peaceful religion this is. Uh, it's a, a perversion of a great faith, said Theresa May the day after the London Bridge attack. In Parliament, the Prime Minister in Parliament very matter-of-factly told the world, this is the perversion of a great faith. Has she read the Quran? Not in a million years has she read the Quran. She hasn't probably seen a copy of the Quran. She very, <laughs> but she very matter-of-factly made this statement. Now, here's what someone, anyone, in the House of Commons, if we had anyone with a backbone in the House of Commons, because all she got was hooray and applause and yay, great. Anyone, just one person in the House of Commons with some guts, should have stood up and said, excuse me, Prime Minister, can you give us evidence of that, please? You've just made a very grand statement about that religion. Can you back it up with scripture, please? Because I happen to have a copy of the Quran. If I was in Parliament, this is what I would have done. I happen to have a copy of the Quran with me, Prime Minister. And it says that we are, that Muslims are obliged, ordered, commanded to kill the infidel uh, and to subdue the infidel and to, uh, destroy, uh, to destroy us all until we are all beholden to Muslims. It says it over and over again. Muhammad himself told Muslims how to succeed. He said, I have been made victorious with terror. Uh, how, well, this is my justification for believing it isn't the perversion of a great faith, Prime Minister. What is your justification for saying that it is? What's happening, of course, is that she is getting all her advice from the Muslim this of Britain and the Muslim that of Britain. Uh, all groups with an agenda to spread Sharia. The Muslim Council of Britain is openly pro-Sharia, and yet it's still consulted on all sorts of matters. They're, they're trying, Parliament is now trying to come up with a, a definition of Islamophobia, or the criminalization of criticism of Islam, which is what it actually is. And who have they asked to provide them with a definition of Islamophobia? The Muslim Council of Britain and MEND and various other groups. This is insanity. It's insanity. So the only thing that Theresa May knows about Islam is what she's being told by them. The only thing that anyone in Parliament knows about Islam is what they're being told by them. People who want, who are using, who are lying. By the way, Islam also allows, allows Muslims to lie to further the cause of Islam. And especially to lie to the infidel to further the cause of Islam. And that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. And that is who our Prime Minister is getting advice from on this major, major issue that will affect this country for generations. That's who the Prime Minister is getting advice from, her enemy. Basically, the government is being advised by the very ideo ideology that is blowing up the children in the first place. This is how crazy this country is. And this is what we will speak about. We will speak about it. Um, we're not, it's not a one trick uh, pony, though I realize I'm the only one uh, known at the moment. But there is a deputy leader coming uh, and I, we will announce him in the next couple of weeks. We have a committee formed, uh, though it's, it's a rather informal committee at the moment, which I appointed uh, at the very beginning. Um, but now that we have everything in the bag in terms of the Electoral Commission, uh, because we have finally passed the Electoral Commission, we have a bank account. We've been surviving on PayPal until now. Now we have an actual bank account, so we can, people can join a lot easier. We are on our way now. We are on our way now. I, it really is happening, and it really is going to happen. And we're tipping, we're tapping into that dormant, disillusioned people who had given up on politics. And I do think a lot of the people who go out and just vote Labour Tory, Labour Tory, Labour Tory as habit have just gotten, have just gotten dis, just, just, There's no excitement. There's no excitement in politics. When was the last time a politician excited you? It just doesn't happen. They never, they're so monotonous and dreary. And we need to change that, and we will change it. And we also, also, and as well as rocking the boat in politics, we will rock the boat with the media. Rock the boat with the media. The media loathes me, and the feeling is more than mutual. Um, <laughs> But I, I quite like sitting down with the media. I'll tell you why. I, I'll tell you what's sort of great about it is 
And, and what's great is that the entire establishment, every MP in the Commons, so no, no matter who they are, uh, and not just MPs in the Commons, but parties generally, are terrified, terrified of the media, utterly terrified of them. And in, and in, in, in effect, you end up in a, with a situation where the media is all but running the country. Because they allow, the politicians allow the media to dictate to them what they should and shouldn't say, what their policies would be, and because they're so terrified of bad headlines. I couldn't care less about bad headlines now. As far as I'm concerned, the more pu any publicity is good publicity. But the other factor is that the journalists are so out, they're so out of touch with normal human beings. You know, the journalists live in the bubble with the politicians. There is a bubble, a protective bubble. Uh, they spend, the politicians spend their whole lives in it. And their lives are essentially conferences, uh, press events, uh, and, and, and events with, uh, filled with wine and, and all the rest of it. This is, what they, this is how they live. They spend their entire lives in the sort of Westminster clique uh, and see nothing beyond it. So to them, the, the threat is not the electorate. They're not afraid of the electorate. The threat is the press. And that's their, and yet they, they you know, they, it's always the same journalists. It's a little clique again. They all drink in the same wine bars, the politicians and the journalists. They all have a vested interest in the status quo, and they all want to keep this thing propped up. And they're all very happy to share power between Labour and the Tories and keep things as they are. They're all doing very nicely out of it. Thank you. How many, how many times do you have to go to surgery? Sorry? How many times do you have to go to surgery? How many? Yeah, how many times a politician... Oh, right, okay, yeah. sorry. Um, I, uh, do they at all? Yeah. Certainly not the big ones. Certainly not yeah. the... the, the yeah, Look, they, they have completely, completely lost any sort of touch. And, and I think, to be fair, I think it's probably... It's e probably easy to get sucked into these things, but what it reveals to me about them as characters is that they went into this for the lifestyle and not for any principled position. And that is most of them. That is most of them. I, I think there was a time, there was a time when the Labour Party was all about the working class. So there was a time when there were policies, even in my lifetime, there, were the odd, there was the odd MP who was in there to do the right thing, who was in there to do good. Uh, whether they're able to or not is another matter. But there certainly have been honourable and principled MPs. I think that number, small number, is dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. It's become a profession. And you can see it in the trajectory that the MPs take. You'll see they'll start, they'll have spent most of their life from, from early teens, if not earlier, uh, involved in local party politics, uh, steeped in party politics. Uh, they will go, they will know all the right people in the constituency party. Uh, they will make all the right noises in the constituency party. They'll probably get a job as a researcher or an assistant to an MP or, or someone similar. Uh, or they'll get a senior job in the party, work their way up through the party, and then slide nicely into a safe seat. This is the trajectory of, I think, most of our MPs now. In other words, all they know is party politics. All they know is media, exactly. How many, how many MPs in the Commons do you think know what it's like to get up in the morning and go out in the rain and stand at a bus stop in the rain and go to work in the rain and sit there from 9 o'clock to 5 o'clock and then get the bus home again in the rain? How many of them know how, that, what that's like? None. If a, a handful, if at all. So we have to rock that boat and shake it up. But we also have to shake the media. We also have to shake the media. And again, because the, the public will love it. People will love it. You know, the, the biggest, and, and this is uh, just last time I mentioned UKIP, I promise, but again, it's relevant. UKIP's biggest fear was the media. And it, this, again, was what was told to me. You know, the media will crucify us if we let you loose on people. We can't, you know, they, they're gonna, they will, they'll crucify us. We'll be in real trouble. And what I kept, what I continue to think about UKIP is that your biggest problem is not the media. Your biggest problem is your fear of the media. If you are stop being so afraid of them, you will actually uh, surpass them. You'll go beyond them. Look at Donald Trump. Look at Donald Trump. The media did everything they possibly 
could to make sure this guy couldn't win. They were putting out polls saying that 90% of people were, were voting for Hillary Clinton, that Clinton was on a 90%. You know, this is the kind of polls they were putting out. This is how much they were trying to influence people into thinking, well, there's no point in vote, voting Trump if, if Clinton is on 90%, what's the point? This is the kind of stuff. It's the subliminal messages being sent out all the time, but with very clear direction in it for what the public ought to think and ought to do. Take them on. Take them on. Most of them, with all due, due respect to them, uh, most of them are not very clued up on things anyway. Uh, if you'll find that if you sit down and talk about Islam with them, uh, they won't have a clue. Well, they won't have a clue of the topic. And you can run, absolutely run rings around them. Yeah. Uh, you, know, the, you can, because they don't know what they're talking about. I, had, I, had, I chatted with um, Godfrey Bloom I met recently, um, and we were talking about economics. And he said the same thing to me. He used to have fun with it. He used to have fun with it. He would go on to talk about an economic issue, and the journalists would have no clue of the issue. And they don't even do basic research, by the way. Not even basic research do they do. And he used to just have fun with them. It's great. They have no idea what they're talking about. You can be, you know, this is, and, it, and, and he was, how popular was Godfrey Bloom when he was on TV? His videos would go viral. People love it. Another example was Jordan Peterson recently. Did you see that Jordan Peterson interview on Channel 4? Was, how fantastic was that? How fantastic was that? A smug, lefty, know-it-all journalist from Channel 4, and he destroyed her. It was fantastic, and the people loved it. I, can, I am convinced that the majority of people loathe the mainstream media and would absolutely get on board with a party willing to take them on, really willing to take them on. And it doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they say about you, because they're so out of touch and so in their own little bubble as well that they think that they think by putting a certain headline that it's going to harm us when actually it's helping us. Uh, and that's how, how, how out of touch they are. Uh, they, will make, they will try to make you look like a fool. They'll try and pick out what they think are unacceptable comments. When actually, half the country will agree with those comments. But they think they're destroying us or well, they're helping us. But even that aside, even that aside, we don't need them anyway. We don't need them anyway. The internet has transformed well, it's transformed everything, really, hasn't it? Um, some of it is not for the better. Uh, some of it is. I'm, I'm ambivalent about um, the whole, the new internet age. Uh, some of it scares me a little bit. I'm not very good on the internet. Um, but in terms of politics, it has transformed everything. It has transformed the world. Uh, Trump, it, it, I don't think it's any exaggeration to say that Donald Trump won the US presidency on Twitter. I really don't. His tweets are legendary, absolutely legendary. And it, it was an enormous help to him. It was an enormous help to him. This party has, has basically been built uh, on, uh, thus far, I mean, uh, on social media as well. Uh, no one would know who I was if it wasn't for Twitter. I'm sure of that as well. Thus far, I mean. Um, but so it's changed everything. It's changed everything. And I want us to have a very slick, uh, and we will as we go on because we've, again, uh, obstacles have been overcome. So now the party proper is being built. Uh, a very slick online presence, and we will, um, which will be hugely helpful and will reach a lot of young people. Because I'm always asked, how do we reach the young people? Well, this is the obvious answer. I also want us to be going to universities uh, and giving talks. And we will demand our right to. But I still haven't had a student come. Are you a student? Yes. Yeah. I'll talk to you in a minute. Uh, is it, Two students, I'll talk to you in a minute. Um, we should be going into universities. Other parties go into universities. Uh, why not us? Let's demand our right to go into universities because I'm convinced also there's a lot of lonely students. Not all students have been brainwashed uh, by the education system uh, run by the ultra-left National Union of Teachers, an organization that needs to be put right in its place. Uh, because it is destroying education in this country uh, and, and producing a lot of uh, unprepared for work but politically, uh, uh, politically indoctrinated uh, children. And then they are going into universities where the uh, political indoctrination will continue. And in fact, it will be ramped up. Uh, and then they'll go into the, to the, either into politics or to the public sector or into journalism or into law. And we'll have eventually the whole of society swimming with people who have been entirely indoctrinated uh, with extreme left, 
We're not talking about old Labour working class trade union left. We're talking about extreme left and extreme anti-British. Extreme anti-British as well is what, it, what is being produced. Now, with our education policy, our, our policy on education once again is very clear. Uh, we need to get rid of the NUT. How we do it, I don't know, but we need to get rid of them. We need to get rid of them. Or we need to regulate them. Uh, because they are, they are a, a. They think that they are uh, a law unto themselves. They act like they're a law unto themselves. They refused at a national conference a couple of years ago, having been directed by government to teach British values to children. They passed a motion at their national conference saying we will not teach British values to children. Where did they get the rights from to just defy uh, the national curriculum in this way? What they were going to do was teach international values. Something that doesn't exist, of course. Um, but, but this is where we are. This is where we are. We need a clear national curriculum, and one which teaches children about the achievements and contributions of Britain in world history and the incredible uh, and, and rich contribution that this country has made to the world for centuries. I want children to hear about that. I want the flag flying outside schools. I want uh, 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 children to know that the sport they are playing is quite likely to have been invented in this country. I want a bit of pride restored because they're, the reason they're destroying, and it, this is, this is the, the anti-white sentiment comes into this as well, the reason they're destroying the identity of children of British children is to create a society where they can dominate and we won't fight back. You have to love your country to fight for it. And they are creating generations who not only don't love the country but who hate the country. And that's their aim. And when you hate something you won't fight for it. And then they can turn it into whatever they like. This is what this is. What this, is. this is why the primary schools are so important and why they're so uh, keen on getting control of them. Right. I think, so those are our four C's, clarity, commitment, common sense and courage. I do believe, I really do believe in the future of this party. Uh, even I was pleasantly surpri surprised last Thursday uh, by how well we did and that was just dipping a toe in the water. What I want now to happen is for branches to form all over the country, to have people in mind, if you have got elections, local elections next year, to have people in mind from early on to stand as candidates. We will, uh, we will provide the leaflets and we'll provide all the resources that we can for the candidates. Any expenses for the candidates we will pay for because that's the point of it. Um, and let's stand 100, 200 people next year and give people a real choice. Give people a real choice. I also want to get looking at the Welsh Assembly and the Scottish Parliament and the London Assembly. I want us to start looking very hard at these. I also want us to be leafleting when there's nothing going on. Uh, we have the, the Kent branch which uh, is forming now, where I was on Tuesday. Immediately they want leaflets. They want to be leafleting now. We should be leafleting all year round. Uh, we shouldn't be door knocking all year round, but we should be leafleting all year round. And um, we are. And at every event that I speak at, we spoke, I spoke at the uh, free speech event in London on Sunday. We gave out thousands of leaflets at that. Uh, and we will, we've given out uh, thousands of leaflets at other events as well. So we will continue to do that. And this is another reason we don't necessarily have to be so afraid of the media. Because good old fashioned leafleting works. It really does. I think we did so well on these elections largely because of leafleting. We handed out thousands, we covered thousands of houses. Uh, so it good old fashioned politics works. But look, what the country wants is a clear, honest, plain English defense of this country. It wants clear morals. There are no, the moral boundaries are completely destroyed. People are getting all sorts of mixed messages. We're letting people away with child rape. Where are our morals? Where is the, who are we? Who are we? When we can allow uh, hundreds of girls to be raped in the streets and do nothing about it, where is the moral, where is the moral clarity coming from our leadership? I mean, Theresa May was very fast to apologize for Windrush, but when is she going to apologize for Rotherham? Where are any of them going to apologize for Rotherham? They're not, because they don't care. And that sends a very uh, disturbing message to the people in this country that we have no morals. The morals are gone. Where, who, where are our morals? We need to give a clear direction about what we will not 
tolerate and we will not tolerate child abuse and this we will not tolerate it we need to say that the country needs reassurance we also need to say that we will not tolerate this mass immigration we will bring it to an end we will not tolerate the islamization of our society we will bring it to an end and what we are opposed to is clear but what we are for also has to be clear we want a free sovereign britain with an accountable government, a uh, parliament which is accountable to the people. We want an honest press, a press which is challenged when it tells lies, a press which is, uh, is pressured, pressured into telling the truth for a change because a democratic process can only work when the media tells the truth because currently people are voting based upon lies uh, propagated by the media. We need our democracy to work. We need honest, real, clear, politics and honest real politicians we need a media that conveys the message with an ounce of honesty and then the people will vote i trust the decent majority in this country to vote for what needs to be done i trust them to do it and i think they will do it and the time for it is now timing is everything the time for it is now we have come along at exactly the right time uh, the people are waiting for this kind of party and we're going to give it to them i'm going to finish there uh, and I'll take some questions and thank you for listening to me. Okay, yes. I'd just like to make a couple of points that you were uh, discussing. Um, where politicians are concerned, my oldest pal from nearly 60 years ago, National Service Days, was a Fleet Street uh, journalist, nearly all his life, and then he became independent. About 20 years ago, we were on the phone, and I was leaning off about politicians now, not like they used to be, etc. He said, no, you've got the wrong idea. Totally wrong. When we were young, we talked about politicians' career with the country of interest. No, not now. They go straight out of university. They get some sort of job that will get them close to government. Yeah. Finally, they get a seat. MP. They give it 10 years. And they'll tell you, they're giving it 10 years, during which time they're going to network. If during that time they manage to get in the cabinet and something opens up, okay, they might stick with it. But if not, after in that 10 year period, they made all the contacts to get out into business. Yeah. Up there, not down here. That's the first thing. And he was dead right. Secondly, where Islam is concerned, I met a Muslim in hospital who was determined he was going to die because he'd walked away from his religion when I was about 17. Incredibly intelligent man, charming man. And he got me interested in then comparative religion to find what all the various ideas were. So I read in the library for months and I came across something called the Golden Rule. I've still got a copy of all the major religions that say in various forms, do as you would be done by, anything if you've done to thee will cause thee harm, do it not unto any other. And they're all there, Zoroastrianism, Confucianism, whatever you like, they're all there. There is one which I refuse to call a religion. It's a political ideology. It's not a religion at all. It doesn't have it. The Muslim religion. It's not there. That golden rule. Said the whole thing about it then. For the rest of my life, if anybody said anything about the Muslim religion, I'd say, I won't say a lot against it, but I'll tell you something that's missing. You make up your own mind. Yeah. yeah. I, I, people I, don't know this. Yeah, no, they don't. They have no idea. They don't. And actually, I should make a point of saying it probably a bit more often. Um, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. There is no golden rule in Islam. And you're absolutely right that it is a political ideology. <laughs> it's a totalitarian political ideology, uh, which seeks absolute control over every aspect of a person's life. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is objectively true. You only need to pick up the Quran and read it to see that that's true. But more, more so, uh, we don't have to depend on the Quran. We just have to look around the world. Just look at the countries where Islam has power and see how they are, you know. And, and then you have to look at the areas in this country where Islam has power. And there are areas in this country where Islam has power. And they're exactly the same. Yes. Now, it's not a coincidence. They don't know also, sadly, um, that the greatest uh, slaving nation in the world was Islam. Mm -hmm. Long before America, long before anything else, they were the greatest slaving nation for the same reason. They are working on the, what we, the Nazis call, used to call the Untermensch. If you were not a follower of Islam, then you weren't really human. So why can't we grab you from anywhere and use you for our purposes? Slavery. 
and they raided the whole of the Western world, which was the real reason for the Crusades. Yeah. Not religion, it was survival. Well, it, yeah, and finally, as well, after many years, finally. Uh, but, but history has been rewritten in that regard as well. Yeah. Now yeah, we're, we're, we're told that the lies, Crusades right, were... It's and it's an incredible thing, you'll hear people actually using it. Our, our people actually using it as justification when we're hit with a terror attack. Yeah. Oh, but come on, you have to think about what we did. What? What? 400 years. Uh, talk about. Isn't it? Yeah, but, I, but talk about self hatred. Where does that level of self hatred come from? Well, I know where it comes from. It comes from being taught by left wing teachers. Um, yeah. your talk, you were going on about us having no morals anymore. Mm. I mean, the great disease of our time is relativism. Yes. And this lies at the heart of what we're doing to ourselves at the moment. I'm worried about religion, but I'm not just worried about Islam. I'm worried about Christianity. It seems we're led by a Caiaphas in Canterbury at the moment. Where are the Peters and Pauls? Yeah. You know, They don't even know their own religion. They think all religious people are equally nice. You know, They're all relatively uh, the same, and they're all relatively irrelevant. Well, there's one religion on this earth that has no intention of being irrelevant. And it's in our midst now. Yeah. And so. I managed, when I was at Hewish College in Taunton, to stop the sixth form students there being taken to the East London Mosque. It took a lot of doing before I retired. Well they now go to a little mosque in Bristol that's a lot gentler. <laughs> but there are people in this country, and this was a head of RE, who could not see the wood for the trees, and the clergy of the Church of England are like this. You, know, you see Giles Fraser on television or on the radio, and they just don't get it. It's, it is, yeah, you're right to be worried about, about that, because I think uh, Christian churches, and, and it's for the Church of England and the Catholic Church, uh, the Pope is exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Pope, successive actually, popes and archbishops of Canterbury, have done the same thing. Yes. Uh, open up the borders to the whole world. Uh, the, even the royal family is doing it. Yeah. Even the royal yeah. family is doing it. Um, but you will see, you know, when the migration crisis, when Merkel opened the borders in 2015 uh, and invited the world to come, which of course they did, uh, the, the Pope uh, uh, jump, you know, uh, jumped up and said, we've got to be compassionate to, to refugees and, and uh, you know, love your enemy. And this is where I said that Christian philosophy itself is actually causing a problem. Uh, love your enemy. Uh, your enemy doesn't love you. Uh, and if we're talking about, if you're talking about bringing in potentially uh, millions, for, which is what it will become, if it, it is already, but in, in a shorter time, uh, of Muslims into Europe, uh, we, can, we can pretend, we can say, well, we've got to love our enemy, uh, but they're not going to love you back. Uh, yeah. You can love them while they're chopping your head off, if you like, but that's what's going to happen. Love your enemy also, of course, is not found in Islam, the same as you were saying about the Golden Rule. Exactly. You know, it? you know, yes. It's found in Kant and all the rest of it, but not in Islam. And, I mean, Islam does want to control everybody's life, and in my case, it wants to throw me off a high place. Now, you know, you get people like Matthew Paris cannot see that. Uh, These yeah. absolute idiots. If, if you wanted to be gay in Palestine, you'd have to move to bloody Israel, as Douglas Murray puts it. Yeah. You know, can't they see it? Exactly. It's the, it's the ultimate question. I must get asked, it's probably the most common question I get asked, is why can't people see it? I, I don't know. Um, I, I th a combination of things, it depends on the individual. Some people are in denial. Yeah. Um, some people are so indoctrinated into, we are all the same. The we are all the same philosophy, which is of course nonsense. We have been taught that it doesn't matter where you're from, it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter how you're raised, it doesn't matter your religion, or we're all essentially the same underneath. Well, this might be true if you go back to day zero, but when you grow up in Pakistan, in rural Pakistan, under strict Islam, you are not the same when you reach 21 as someone who grew up in Newton Abbott. You are not the same. You, too, you, you, will, you still, basic humanity is still there, but you'll be very different in terms of attitudes, in terms of morals, in terms of priorities. You're creating two very different people. And the idea that we can take hundreds of thousands of people out of rural Pakistan 
where the majority believe that you should stone your daughter to death if she's raped. The majority. And pick them up and slap them back down into the middle of 21st century Great Britain and it's all going to go okay because we're all the same really. That's the crazy delusion. And it's the, it's the fluffy, uh, fluffy bunny land that they want to live in, that they want to live in. So there's a level of denial. I'm sorry to say, but there's also a lack of intelligence with many people. They just don't get it. They just can't, you know, there's, there's a real problem with grasping this stuff. There's a real problem with grasping it. And there's a real rejection of liberty going on as well. The rejection of the liberty to say what we really think. Uh, people are terrified of it. It's very unfair to tell people that they're all the same with it. Because my grandfather sailed around the world and all the rest of it. And when I was very small, he's a very taciturn man, but he once, we were talking and said, oh, Germans are a comic or something. I was about six and he said, no, son. We'll always beat the Germans, because the Germans are so close to us, it's like family, and families always fight. But I think we'll always beat them. But he said, them Ruskies, you know, they're funny devils. He said, because actually they're mongrels. They've got one foot in the east and one foot in the west. Now, you've got to be very careful with mongrels, but I think we can handle them. But when it comes to the Chinamen... How on PC is this? <laughs> this is what people will not face up to. Great. When he said, come to the Chinamen, I don't think we'll have much of a chance there, son. You know why? They don't think like us. And this is true. Yeah. So it's terribly unfair to say you're all equal because then you expect somebody else to think like you. And it may be right that you expect them or it may be wrong because you can't put yourself into their shoes, into their, whatever you like to call it, ethos, ethos is it? and say they should act my way. Therefore, it's totally unfair to say they're all equal. We're not all equal. No, we're not. Not in any way no, at all. No. no, we're not. And this obsession with equality that we've had mm. in the last couple of decades, it, it has morphed into, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a, you know, in a democracy, we are equal. Uh, we all have the same civil rights. We all have the same status before the law. Um, and this is right. This is, this is how it should be. Uh, but what they've done with a noble uh, concept of equality is turn it into something uh, that is is um, is completely devoid of all common sense and devoid of all objective realities. Uh, we are all equal in in terms of in this country we all have the same civil rights, uh, but we're not all the same. We're not all the same. We don't all have the same attitudes, and we certainly don't have the same attitudes. And we don't. And as, and as how you put it, they don't think like us. Uh, that's 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 the best way I can. It's, it's just the only way I can phrase it. Yeah. You're not going to go into a, a village in rural Pakistan, which is where most Muslims in this country come from. Uh, they're not. They don't think like us. They don't. They can't. They don't. Uh, and we're not going to. We're not. And it, it seems to me that even a couple of generations down the line in Britain, still we've still got a big issue with thinking the same way. We still don't think the same way. Uh, be, we've, we, we're com this, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm amazed, I'm always amazed when people say to me, but you know, bring them here and they'll adapt. And you know, if, we, if we're nice to them and we give them a nice free society, they'll love the freedom and they'll adapt to it. But two generations down the line, they want to blow us up. And your answer is, bring more in, they'll adapt. Uh, it's, it's insanity. It's insanity. It worked, it's the only way to describe it. As a concept, if it worked, then it, it would have it. worked a long time ago Absolutely. in the United States. Um, you know, the, the great melting pot. Everybody would have been well, the United able to become States one did work, but, home, but they haven't. You but say. the United States has worked reasonably well. I mean, it was a European majority, um, of course, and it was built That's by so Europeans. Reasonable. Um, but once again, we, as far as Islam is concerned, you have the same problems in the United States that you have here. And worryingly, it seems to me that most, uh, that are certainly a lot of Americans, certainly that I interact with or know on social media, they look at Europe and think, God, we're never getting into that mess. Uh, and I say, uh, listen, if you think you're not very far behind us, you're not, in fact, I don't think you're behind us at all. There have been loads of terror attacks in America. And they have all the same PC, multi uh, left-wing rubbish in America that they have here. Uh, so they're no, and actually, and actually, I think America is probably in a worse situation than us um, because their demographics are very different to ours. Um, and, uh, you know, the UA, it's already happening with the, you know, calling the Constitution the white man's charter. We know where that's going. 
um, and trying to people wanting to uh, break down what's it called Mount Rushmore uh, because it's a it's a memorial to white men and they want it they want it broken down. So the Constitution, the going after the Constitution is coming. It is coming, and I have to say, if the U.S. Constitution disappears, then we're all in trouble, because it's uh, it's the light that's keeping democracy alive in the West. Uh, and if the, and another reason they'll chip away at it. Hi, Marie, did you say that the um, limited uh, freedom of speech, censorship, um, that's going on at the moment, this is Shred coming in through the back, back door. Yeah, I do. Um, I think the majority of the problems we've got with freedom of speech do stem from Islam. Uh, the le other people have jumped on the bandwagon and demanded, well, if, if you're not allowed to upset them, then why are you allowed to upset me? But it has come, it's started with Islam. It's, it's, it's coming from Islam. We? Hmm? we can all criticize Christianity and Jehovah Witness, and, but we're not allowed, you know, it, it seems to me that that's the first stop with it. Well, we know that Islam would be, we know that Islam is violent. Uh, and we know that if we, you know, this is another reason the police don't do anything about crimes committed by Muslims, is because they know they're risking a riot. And, and, and with good reason. Was it recently in France somebody was arrested for wearing a niqab? And five days of rioting followed. Uh, you know, so they know, they know what's going to happen. But Islam does not mess about. Islam does not mess about. They will not have. They will not have this. They will not have Islam criticized and ridiculed in this way. And it has led overwhelmingly. As I say, other people have jumped on the bandwagon and, and made the most of it. And, and we've, we've lost more and more speech as we go on. But it is overwhelmingly about Islam, definitely. It was Islam who demanded the religious hate speech laws. It was Muslim Council of this and that. Definitely, definitely. It's, it's largely behind it, yeah. The observation is that, that I speak Arabic, I read Arabic, I have spent uh, half my life in the Middle East. And you've got to be very careful about the way you put certain things, because although it isn't generally understood that although the Quran is uniform, uh, Islam is not uniform. There are as many sects in uniform in, in, in Islam as there are in, maybe not quite as many as there are in, in uh, Christianity, but many. Um, stick to the Quran, because when you're talking about the, the Islam, people will be able to throw things at you which are not in the Quran, but are in Shia, Sunni, yeah. and other Muslim sects. That's just an observation. Okay. That's just something that, that may... I, I just okay. leave it with you. No, no, I'll I, answer it. I'll answer it. I'd like to answer it. I'd like to answer it. I'm going to have to disagree, though, uh, slightly. I, the distinction, you see, it depends to me how you define Islam. And to me, Islam is the Quran and Muhammad. Everything else is Muslims. So all the differences, the different sects, are Muslim differences rather than Islam differences. Um, I think if we talk only about the Quran, and I do take your point, and I think you're right, but I think if we talk only about the Quran, uh, we, risked, we risk moving away from, for example, the Hadith, we risk make, uh, moving away from Islamic culture, um, where the problems actually manifest. So the distinction I make is I don't believe there's any such thing as Islamism. This is, a, this is a nonsense. The distinction I make is between Islam and Muslims. Uh, Islam is the Quran and Muhammad, the different sects, the Shia, the Sunni, the Diobandi, the uh, Tablighi Jamaat, we could go on and on, are Muslims. And the differences are between Muslims rather than Islam. And that's how I, how, okay. what I, I think, think about that. I'm just giving my... No, no, it's, it's an important point. It's an important point. That's okay. Thank you. Hi. Oh, sorry, I'll do, can I go to the lady for uh, Right, you, um, you answered part of this question earlier on when you talked about leafleting. And but you say that getting your message out is mostly done on social media. And regrettably, I wasn't at the march this weekend. I wanted to be at that march. Freedom of speech is being closed down in this country. And it's great if the media will give you time and interview you. But, you know, I used to watch your um, sessions on <coughs> Facebook as well, which I think is a brilliant idea and I hope that no matter what happens even in the future you keep up with that but um, they closed your Facebook account down didn't they? Yeah. So what happens if they close a Twitter account down? What happens then if the media don't interview you? How the hell are you supposed to get your message out then? Um, well I must say the it is a concern uh, but 
uh, well, we can still do the old basics. I mean, we can just up our leafleting. There's nothing they can do about that. Um, and I happen to believe in leafleting very much. It's very, very effective, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. The media or the technology giants can't touch it. Uh, I must say, I, the censorship uh, does work because, uh, and I'm probably a bit embarrassed and ashamed to say this, but I have started to change my behavior on Twitter uh, because I can't afford to get kicked off. It really, really will harm us if I get kicked off Twitter. Uh, it may still happen anyway. There are new, there are new things developing all the time. Uh, people who are getting kicked off Twitter are going on to Gab now. I do have an account on Gab, um, and that's what we'll do. And I think, uh, you know, the, the human mind the, the, has limitless creation in in our minds. Uh, I don't think we can be silenced. Uh, they will certainly interrupt us. But I don't think what's that? Well, this is it. This is it. There are there are there are a million ways. There are a million ways. And I, I tell you, uh, being kicked off Twitter is not going to harm Tommy Robinson's career. In fact, it's probably enhanced it. Uh, he he had this was incredible on Sunday. It's a shame you weren't there. We had a massive. There was a massive screen right outside Theresa May's front door. Right outside it. <laughs> It was fantastic. I mean, I'm sure she wasn't in there, but whoever was in there could hear what was going on outside. I, I agree. I agree. I, I'm worried about it. I don't want us. I, I do my uh, daily, web, well, almost daily, uh, webcast thingy live uh, straight on YouTube now. I know. Um, and and, yeah, I know. I know. Uh, we, we did get our Facebook page back, but they wouldn't let us do videos on it. Um, <laughs> But it, it is a concern. It is a concern, but there's nothing they can... I, I think the genie is out of the bottle now. I really do. Uh, they kicked Tommy Robinson off Twitter and look how he responded. There's always a way. Uh, and with, when you have... When public opinion is so strong, they can't stop it. It's like a flood. It's coming. The genie's out of the bottle. There's no way they're going to stop this now. They can impede us. They can cause problems for us. And I'll try my best not to get kicked off Twitter. Try my best, um, but we can. There's always ways. Oh, I, I was in touch with him. I was in touch with him. He did say, um, I think he's coming to the UK soon, but he he said he didn't think he'd have time to do the interview then. So a terrible affli affliction on me is that I might have to go to America to do the interview. <laughs> Life is tough. Life is tough. Um, yeah, yeah, it is a problem, but we'll find a way. We'll find a way. Hi, sorry, can I? Did you? Can, did you have your hand up? Me? Yeah. I was just going to say, how hot were you on Sunday? Because I was pretty roasted. It was hot. It was hot, and there was no relief. We had a black tent at the back, which you went into for ten seconds, and then it became hotter than outside, uh, and the water bottles went fairly quickly. <laughs> I come to you. Um, just one. I mean, there's lots of things I'd like to say, but I'm just going to just one thing, so as not to take too much time. I think. I've been knocking around for a long time doing this this sort of thing, you know. And I think one of the problems is in an area like in an area like this, this part of the country, and similar semi-rural parts of the country, at the moment there's comparatively few Muslims to be seen, and people will say, "Well, we can't see any," you know. But I think what you can draw people's attention to, and what they will get. Is the is what we is what some people call white flight? Absolutely. Where the white people and Anglo-Saxons who live in these Muslim places don't like it and are moving to places like this, and then we're seeing our lovely. I've always lived in Dawlish, and I've and so much of the countryside has been built on and is planned to be built on. You know, great sometimes top quality agricultural land. Yes. You know, we're losing our ability to produce food. And that is something people in areas like this will understand because they don't want the field next to their, behind their garden being built on. So it's just a suggestion, you know. That's my plan. That is my plan. For areas that don't have, haven't been touched by mass immigration, we're going to tell them, save it while you still can. Yeah. That's because that's the message and that's what people will respond to. And it's true. And it's true. Let's save what's left of England and keep it England. Um, because, like I said at the very beginning, there's no, you, you're not going to escape this. It's not going to be escaped. Uh, like you say, the white flight will happen. Uh, and then, and, and then, and then there'll be another flight. There'll be another flight happening as well. 
And you can't, you can't escape. Uh, I mean, I live in a part of Essex, in, in a town, well, near a town that is the only one in the country of its size that still has no mosque um, at Basildon. And I had, I've been there for about two and a half years. I've, li I've lived there for about three years now. But in the last six months or so, I'd never seen a hijab in the first two years I was there. In the last six months, I'm seeing them regularly. So there's no escaping it. And I know Essex is a lot closer um, to, the, to the London outflow, um, but it's coming everywhere. Uh, but you're right, the, the white flight and the, 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 uh, the expanding of what we would like to keep small towns and villages, because that's their character. Uh, they will expand and expand and expand as white flight continues. So there will be no escaping it. And you're absolutely right. Uh, that is going to be our key message for areas like this. Thank you. Who's who's name? Okay. Uh, I want to talk about halal. Okay. Uh, as this gentleman said, there aren't many Muslims in Nunavut, um, but our Asda is selling halal, and I know they are because I've 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 got the chart with the number, like so you can see where it's been slaughtered, and a lot of their chicken is from the two sisters, uh, halal slaughterhouse. Oh, okay. The only. The only chicken they sell that isn't halal is free range. And for a chicken that is halal, it's what, £4.98, I think. For the free range chicken, it's £10.98. And, it's, and I had a row with the manager who swore to my face that they don't stock halal. And I told him he needs to check the numbers. On the they, do ha they do say that. Uh, question them on halal and make it clear that you're anti-halal, and they will tell you there's no halal. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah. always the response. It's, it's always the response. They are. Lying. They are. The reason for that, I mean, you'll find that even small local butchers are now selling halal. The and the, market, the, he won't, he won't there are Yeah, there are a few people. I actually saw someone in the uh, on the newspaper this week from Cornwall uh, urging local restaurants not to serve halal, and apparently having some great success. Yeah. So, great guy. I mean, for years we've had Jewish people live in our country. Mm. They've never forced... No, that's it. Around, that's it. Ever. That's it. That's it. Uh, you'll still see little quaint little uh, kosher supermarkets. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, they keep it to themselves. And actually the law says that kosher and halal should only be consumed or sold to in it. I know, I know. They don't buy it from I, the supermarkets because they don't trust it because they think we've tampered with it because they know we don't like them. So they buy it from their own suppliers. <laughs> But the reason, I mean, a friend of mine, he lives in rural Hertfordshire, and his local butcher, small English butcher, sells halal. Uh, and the reason is because it's the, it's the abattoirs. It's the abattoirs. Yeah, the abattoirs They're demanding. Them, I mean. If I win in a field to sheep to sheep's row, I'd get done. Yeah, you would. You, you certainly would. Um, the RSPCA is, is on the politically correct bandwagon, yeah. um, as is everyone. You know, I, I can't think of an organize, a major organization that isn't. My kids call me a but racist, and I'm not. It's well, just Islam I have a problem with. Well, Islam's, problem Islam's with not a race. But no, it's not, and I've said this to them. I'm not racist because they're not a race. It's, a, it's an ideology yeah. that yeah. I'm against. And you're perfectly entitled to be. British heritage on Oh my word! That's that's. I'm sorry. That's hilarious. By the way, they've just referred me to the that's hilarious. correspondence panel because I've sent two letters to Absolutely them and I use snail mail because snail mail sometimes gets a better result. Yes. You can't just bin it. Yes. yes. And they are. They've referred me to it because I'm being too bloody awkward. And Good. I don't accept Be their awkward. Advice. But they are English, English heritage, the clue is in the name, mm. have got a, uh, a the work placement, work aren't they? placement mm. thing for which white English youngsters need not apply. Yeah, I've seen that. It's the, it's the icing on the cake, isn't it? Yeah. English heritage, no whites allowed. By the way, the this red is, one. This is the crazy. The what's that? The red. The uh, Rev, what's Rev the... Sideways. Oh, right, right. Yeah, he, he wants details on it. Um, I just want to, before I come to you, I just want to finish the point about the RSPCA and, and let you know, because this is something that I um, hear about quite a lot. Their position is another 1984-esque opinion, uh, which is, we are against unstunned slaughter, but it's got nothing to do with religion. So they refuse to say that the unstunned slaughter is a religious slaughter, 
Uh, and they refuse to criticize any religion but say, while saying that they are against the unstung slaughter. And this is the position of, of many organizations that ought to be opposing Islam because it's, it's fundamentally against their values, but they don't because they don't want to insult religion. We have to change that culture. We have to be able to insult whatever we like, uh, and particularly Islam. Uh, and we, we might make a bit of progress with these groups. But it's, you know, it's pretty much all the same as far as I can see. The compassion and world farming, these groups, uh, they're all against it, but they'll do nothing. They'll do nothing because they don't want to upset religion. Online. And people will sign the petition. We have, we've signed a lot of against Halami. You sign the petitions, but it doesn't seem to make an iota of difference because, as you say, all the organisations won't open their gods no, to support you. No, they won't. And they're betraying their own fundamental values. And the ridiculous so. part about it is that, of course, it's based on total um, arcane or archaic mm. superstitions that don't work now because originally it was common sense. Kosher was common sense. You were in a hot country, you didn't have any means of keeping your food clean, and the rest of it. So certain things went off fast, don't eat them. Same with this, bleeding the body out, then in a hot country, that way completely bleeding the body out meant that you could keep the meat longer, you could get it to dry and all the rest of it. That's lunacy nowadays. Everybody's got There's a fridge. There's no reason. Yes. Yeah. With all the refrigeration and everything, there is no way. Yeah, and, and again, Again, we will be the only party with a policy to ban. Not just label it. Labeling's no good. No. Labeling it still happens. Ban it. Ban it from happening here. Ban its import. Uh, and also, I have to. And kosher. Yeah. It has yes. to be. It has to be. We have to ban both of them. And that we're the only party who'll have a policy like that. Hi, I'll come to you now. Yeah, go on. Oh, sorry. Sorry, this sounds a bit random. But uh, what would for Britain's drugs policies be? I think some liberal ones like legalising cannabis would help set us apart from UKIP and uh, maybe win us the youth vote? Um, we've only very vaguely discussed this, and I think the decision was to leave it alone. Um, my, if I'm asked my personal opinion, I will. I think there are some issues we shouldn't uh, touch on. Uh, what drug, cannabis, for example, is one of them. However, uh, I'm unafraid to give you my personal opinion. Uh, I think it's quite shocking, really, the hypocrisy of the fact that we can criminalize people for smoking cannabis while we sell a drug that is much stronger and much more harmful, uh, both socially and individually, in every corner shop. Uh, I think that's a, a quite extraordinary a hypocrisy and an extraordinary injustice. I would personally decriminalize cannabis. I wouldn't do an Amsterdam. Uh, and have it sold openly in shops. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't criminalise people for it either. I think most of the people... I mean, let's, I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, I, if you want, if you, feel, if you think that young people feel strongly about it, maybe we'll discuss it again. Uh, and maybe I'll put it to the vote of the members of the party and see whether we should campaign to decriminalise cannabis or not. Uh, but if you feel that it would gain, to, I actually think it would too. I think it would too. It would, during the UK leadership election, I was asked that question a lot. I think it would too. Uh, maybe we'll discuss it and put a vote to the membership and see what they think. But for the moment, we're thinking of leaving it alone. I think it would also help with the law and order thing as well, because it would help remove power from criminal gangs and help tackle things like issues like grooming and such. It certainly would. And we also know that a lot of the drug trade is being run by you know who in this country. Uh, and it's where they're getting a lot of money and power from. Uh, the, the rape gangs are, are not just rape gangs. There's a lot of uh, other crime going on there as well. And Tommy Robinson has been shouting for years about drug heroin dealers in Luton, uh, which are Muslim gangs. Yeah, okay, okay. I was, I was hoping to avoid it, but, <laughs> but I think you're right, actually. I think maybe we ought to have a policy on it. I'll, um, we'll, I'll bring it back to our committee meeting, which we're having on the 20th, and there's going to be a huge update for everyone after that. Um, I'll bring it up again. When you need to sell your merchandise, your badges. There's a really brilliant book coming out soon. Uh, no, my book is coming out soon. Finally, after five years of trying to get this thing together and published, it'll be out at the start of June. Um, I'll remind everyone daily that it's out, so don't worry. Um, hi, can I, you know, I was just, just going to say about the lady saying about getting to London to the demos. If you've got different branches around the country, would we be able to organise trips to your 
I didn't get. I, I was somewhere else. Otherwise, I'd have been there. Oh, oh, I, I couldn't get there. You know, two living all the way down here. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, the, the um, yeah, it becomes expensive yeah. when you're on a train. It's a You know, absolutely. And what they did up in in Leeds, they for a Britain branch up in Leeds, was hire a coach, a minibus, and all came down together. Um, they've done that a couple of times actually. So actually, I yeah, think let's. Online about sharing petrol, but yeah, no, we should do that actually. There's one. I tell you what. There's one coming up on the 23rd of June. Yeah. Also in London, UK Freedom and, and UK Freedom and Unity. Um, I'm speaking at that. So why don't we to beforehand? I'll give everyone a shout uh, to sort of prompt a little and maybe get some some uh, minibuses hired uh, and get get a crowd. To London for that day. I'm trying to set a Newton Abbott branch up. Yeah. So if you are from Newton Abbott, yeah. see me. We'll get together maybe once a month, set a branch up. Then when we do these parades in London or wherever, we can then car share yeah, or yeah. get mini bus driving to wherever. But by coming together, we can do that. And that's okay. one of the reasons. Um, we've thanks done today. once again, everyone, for, for coming. Um, and I hope to see you another time. Do get involved. Do get involved because we're going places. I can promise you that. Thank you. Thank you.